Hello, Waukee Christian Church, Pastor Gray here, and today we're going to be looking at Chapter 3 of Holy Chaos by Amanda Henderson. In the previous two chapters in the introduction, we sort of built a foundation for understanding these important terms uh, that Amanda is giving to us, and now this time what we're doing is we're going to engage in those terms and those ideas. Amanda starts this chapter by talking about a tragedy that she experienced in her life when she and a colleague got pregnant at roughly around the same time. And while Amanda gave birth to her, to her child, her colleague, unfortunately, in, in the last term when she was due to deliver, had a miscarriage. And it was a scary thing that happened where, where we don't know how to navigate these hurt feelings. And sometimes when we want to provide comfort, we say things that on the surface sound like they might mean something, but underneath, they don't really mean anything at all. And so what Amanda ended up saying to her colleague was this, everything happens for a reason. This statement is one of the worst things I think that you can say to a person going through something, especially if it's something you can't relate to. Everything happens for a reason tends to blame God and, and God's cosmic design for doing this horrible, awful thing to you. And in reading that, I'm reminded of another book that I've read earlier this year by an author, uh, Kate Bauer, and her book is called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. And in that book, um, Kate Bauer talks about how she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer and was writing a book um, on what she thought was, would be her deathbed. Thankfully, she survived, but it is something that happened to her where when she was diagnosed after having just given birth to a child, um, people around her started telling her, hey, everything happens for a reason. Unfortunately, that didn't help her feel better, but it was a lie that she, she came to love because it filled her with some kind of comfort, even if, it was, even if it wasn't theologically sound. And she came to realize it wasn't theologically sound. And it was only in, in being on the receiving end of tragedy she realized that saying uh, everything happens for a reason doesn't hold a lot of water. And so when... When Amanda tells her colleague that everything happens for a reason, the colleague replies, my priest said, this is not what God wants. God did not want my baby to die. And if God doesn't want for death, if God doesn't want for these kind of tragedies, but it happens for a reason, how can both of those things be true? The answer is that they're not. And as much as we like to grab onto everything happens for a reason and God has this divine plan that sometimes includes our, our profound suffering, um, I think we ought to let go of that. Not everything happens for a reason. Not every minute detail happens according to a, a micromanaged plan that God has. God does not want for these things to happen. But because of the world we live in, they do happen. And instead of God being the puppet master, maybe it'd be better if we think of God as a person who goes through it with us. And I think that was the point of Jesus' ministry, to show that God suffers and lives and celebrates and hurts alongside us, not as an overarching deity in massive control of everything, but as a confidant and a friend and a person who loves us so much that they are there with us. Because of this instance, Amanda Henderson has an experience where she engages in deconstruction and she talks about her roots, what, what roots are for her. She begins to scrutinize her beliefs, both politically and religiously, and she grows these things called roots. And in this metaphor of roots, what Amanda is doing is she is saying that we need to have roots that we're ready to defend, ideas we're ready to hold on to, and if we're going to be able to defend them, we have to be educated about them. We have to give them more than just a passing thought. We have to actually get into the books and, and engage in what we what is really, really important to us. The roots metaphor is not a metaphor of rigidity. And in our Sunday school class, we talked about <laughs> what, what kind of rigid statements we've heard in the past that kind of are, are not great bits of wisdom. So think about um, these two quotes that, that I've thought of. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. While there is a nugget of truth in that statement, 
it sort of promotes an idea that you have to hold true to your convictions. You have to have these principles that don't ever, ever, ever change, right? But that's not necessarily true. As more evidence and more experience presents itself to you, you should be willing to change. Your roots should be able to change, but they should not be so flimsy that anything knocks them over. They should be strong enough and studied enough and considered enough that you are ready to defend them. But if something else presents itself, like they do with Amanda, you need to be able to change those as well. Roots that are strong enough to tether you to the ground, but flexible enough to grow in new directions. That's what Amanda is getting at. Through Amanda's deconstruction, um, she ended up going to seminary, which is, you know, school for pastors, and she ended up getting much more involved in church. She, she grew by leaps and bounds away from her more conservative upbringing and ideas towards a more progressive um, and liberation theology framework, and that really helped in her work in Colorado. Um, what, what she goes on to say is that empathy is, is one of the most important things that you can do when it comes to building roots. And she says this, she, she talks about her roots on religious issues, and she has seven of them, but I'm only going to mention this one because it produced really great, rich discussion uh, in our Sunday school. Love people in ways that actually feel loving to them. And she illustrates this with an example of how she had invited a Jewish woman to go to service with her. And when they offered her communion, the Jewish woman was offended. To Amanda, offering someone communion was a grand gesture of inclusion and acceptance, but to this Jewish woman, it was a mockery of her religion, and she felt offended. And that seems to be what we do sometimes when it comes to love. We give people what we would want, what we think that they would want, without really stopping to ask, do you want this thing? Is this really what means something to you? And I'm reminded of the love languages. And this is something that as a married man, I've had to master in order to have a healthier marriage. You need to consider what is it that this, that this person desires, right? It, it's practicing empathy. I am a gifts person. I like receiving gifts. Those resonate to me. My wife likes words of affirmation. Different people like different things. And we're talking about a macro level, not just a relationship between two people, Different cultures, different societies, and different religions have different values, and we ought to know those things if we're going to be engaging in people with people differently from ourselves. Think also about political divides. People of different political persuasions or different heritages. Heri heritages? People of a different heritage. They might have a different idea of, of what love means to them or what service would look like to them, and that's worth considering. Amanda asks us to scrutinize our own beliefs, to, to build a lens that is different from what we just know and stop being so, so preoccupied with our own worldview to consider others. And she asks, what do we believe? What sources inform our response to this question of belief? Who has shaped me in the lenses through which I view the world? Where are my blind spots? She goes on for several more, but this next one is one of my favorites. Whose viewpoint and experience are so far outside of my own that I can hardly fathom them? We are removed due to our social location, due to our upbringing, due to our culture, from other people. There are people whose cultures and lives are radically different. We can hardly relate to them in any meaningful way. And who are those people to us? For me, it might be people who speak a different language. It might be people who, whose political persuasions are so passionate that I can't even begin to think of how I could relate to those people, especially if they're on the other side of my own. There have been times in my life, and perhaps maybe times in your life, where you have met someone who was so passionate about something you knew nothing about that you could not be their friend because you didn't think you had anything in common with them. Who are those people? That's what Amanda wants us to, to ask ourselves. Who are those people in our lives? And what does it mean to be in relationship with them? How can we do that? The answer is without empathy, without education, without scrutiny of our own thoughts and worldviews and ideas, we can't. She then talks about political roots and, and, and what that means for her. 
Um, and she says on, on page 44 in the second paragraph, Becoming rooted in my political views meant both learning how to stand up for what I believed and learning to embody kindness in the face of difference. We inherit so much from the immediate world around us, from our parents and our grandparents and from the culture that we grew up in, from our schools, that sometimes we are instilled with ideas, almost pre-programmed with ideas, that never go under the lens of scrutiny, that never get examined. In growing up, I was raised to think that gay people were the bane of the United States existence, that they threatened everything that we stood for, that they threatened traditional marriage. Um, and, and I believed that for a very long time. It wasn't until people I loved, people close to me, came out of the closet that I began to consider that maybe these people aren't fountains of sin and, and disgusting perverts. Maybe they're just human beings that are different from me. And in realizing that, in, in realizing that there was a difference, I was able to ask questions, become better educated. Um, I was able to become interested in, in books and, and, and sources of information that I would never have looked at otherwise. And it occurs to me that until we are personally affected by these ideas, they don't mean a whole lot to us. In our Sunday school class, we had one person who said that it wasn't until she found herself disabled and unable to work that she had real empathy for people on food stamps and people receiving assistance. It's really, really easy to hate from afar. And if hate's too strong a word, it's really, really easy to cast negative judgment from afar when it doesn't affect us. But when it's us, when, it, when we're suffering, things change. When it's people we love who suffer, things change. Think about cancer walks. A lot of the people who take part in cancer walks to raise money for a cure, they're usually people immediately affected. When we think about being empathetic, it's usually because we're immediately affected, but it shouldn't have to be. We should be able to beat the world to the punch and become empathetic anyway, even if it doesn't affect us. Because if we're all a society, if we're all fellow citizens and, and sons and daughters of God, shouldn't we all care? Shouldn't we consider ourselves immediately affected? Amanda goes on to talk about um, her, her political ideas and how they developed. And then she names her roots on political issues. And she has six of those, my favorite one being number five. And she says this, never demonize or dismiss those with opposing political views. I should have a clear argument that states my opinion and live my view through my actions. This speaks louder than any demonizing can ever do. When we get into political disagreements and debates, we tend to get into them with the intention of winning. We want to have the better argument. We want to own the other person. If I had a nickel for every time I heard some pundits saying how they wanted to own the libs, I would, <laughs> I would have enough money, I think, to subscribe to better news articles. But the point is, it should never be to own. It should never be to win. It should never be to humiliate. It should be to learn, to engage in empathy, and to listen. And to ask good questions, not loaded questions, not questions with the intention of using it against a person, but to ask why do you believe that? Where do you get that information? How does it make you feel when this kind of thing happens? Where are you from? What did your parents believe? These are good questions, and these are questions that help a person learn, but questions with the, the questions that are asked in bad faith that I wondered when I would record a video where the phone would start ringing. There it is. Anyways, questions asked in bad faith aren't good for anybody. They fill us with a, a sense of smugness and reinforce our ideas of supremacy, and they only serve to alienate the person we are debating with. This past Tuesday, we had our first presidential election for the, uh, for the 2020 presidential debates, and it was a catastrophe. It was a catastrophe because it wasn't a debate done in good faith. It wasn't a debate done between who should have been professionals. It was name calling and bullying and, and just ugliness all around. It was an embarrassment, quite frankly. Um, this is what Amanda Henderson wants to avoid, this kind of name calling and ugliness. 
Amanda leaves us in this chapter uh, for these questions for reflection. I encourage you to pause the video after I read each question so that you might be able to answer it for yourself. What formative experience significantly shaped the way you view and move through the world? What are the core principles that root you? How have your beliefs on the most critical issues been shaped? Identify a change you have experienced in a core value or belief you held. What prompted that change? And finally, what do you experience in your body when you or others confront divisive issues? It's a lot to consider. It's a lot to think about. But thankfully, we have each other to discuss with. And I look forward to seeing you next week as we move into Chapter 4, I Can't Breathe, Seeing Fear. Until then, thanks for watching. Bye.